Hi everyone, welcome to Tech Talks. Today we have six INFP males. And so Kevin, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Hi, uh, my name is Kevin. I have preferences for INFP and I am a type enthusiast. Yeah, and he also created his own MBTI course on Udemy. So I will have that link below too. Thanks, Joyce. You're welcome. And Nathan? Hi everyone, I'm Nathan. I'm from Montreal, Canada. Um, even the idea of like, how do you present yourself to people for the first time and what type of information you present to me can speak to like what functions we use. Like, do I just start talking about practical matters, you know, or do I start talking about like, what is my emotional journey right now? And where am I at emotionally if I want to speak to my FI dominus, right? But um, I guess um, more practically speaking, I currently am hosting workshops on the cognitive functions and socials and um i'm super happy to be here i'm so excited to be part of this panel and looking forward to seeing what we talk about splendid to have you on nathan and so he mentions how the way that you introduce yourself is indicative of your type too and so that's why i allow people to introduce themselves as they please because I think that it's really good experimental lab rat data on what they emphasize when they talk about themselves. And so, Nigel? I'm Nigel. Um, I feel like saying that I'm a generic INFP for now, to keep it short, and hope that it comes out in the rest of the conversation. But yeah, I'm super happy to be here, and it feels like I've jumped inside YouTube because I've been a fan of this channel for a very long time. So, hey. Big hearts to you, Nigel. Thanks for watching. <laughs> And Martin? Hey, my name is Martin Tam. I'm from Canada. Um, let's see. I mean, I like philosophy, psychology, uh, religion. I'm a trained minister, so I'm actually a pastor at church. Uh, I work with young adults, with youth. But yeah, that's me. And I'm an adult. So there you go. Adults always explain what they're doing, right? Like what the career is. So that encapsulates all that I am. The sarcasm there is real. <laughs> and Paul? Uh, hi everyone, I'm Paul, uh, also an INFP. Uh, uh, on the Enneagram, since it was brought up, uh, I'm a nine wing one, uh, sexual self-preservation. I believe my tri-type is nine, four, five. Uh, Another Canadian resident, I'm in Vancouver, and uh, yeah, I'm also married to my typological opposite, an ESTJ. Yeah, magnificent. Canadians represent. And ESTJ female type tips, not Leon. Hi, I'm also non-Canadian as well. That's another non-status that I am. But uh, I, I'm uh, I'm an INFP female. This is just a, this is just opposite day for me, or I, maybe I should say it's not opposite day right now. And I'm also a, a big fan of Joyce's work. You're all pulling on my heartstrings, I swear. Gosh. And so everyone, feel free to check out Leon's channel, Type Tips. And so hi, my name is Joyce, and I'm a certified MBTI practitioner. Well, certified MBTI master practitioner now. And I facilitate the instrument in organizations. And so the first topic of tonight is one that Kevin brought up, actually. And it was that INFPs typically feel like they're playing the game of life on hard mode. Could you go into that? Yeah, I don't know. I guess I just had like some kind of realization. Um, um, I am a gamer. I think a lot of INFPs play games. We like to play games. I think it helps us uh, go into this little imaginary world that we have. It's easy to escape in. And um, one time I just made the, the connection that um, as I was growing up, just things were just harder. Like uh, I wasn't um, allowed to be myself. And because of that, uh, the game of life was like on hard mode. Like if you put on the hardest difficulty and you tried playing it and you just kept losing. What parts of life are hard for you all? Everything. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's well, it, it could be kind of hard to fit in. So a, a good analogy is that uh, that when it comes to the game of life, INFPs are really bad avatars, right? Not, not bad avatars, but not easy to use avatars. That's a better 
better way to say it, right? So, but but once you're able to use the avatar really well, then it could do a lot of cool moves because it could bring a lot of um, individuality and creativity to the table. Yeah, I kind of think of that secret, like that joke character in fighting games that's actually like really good when you kind of spend time with it. And I guess in general, I do like um, identify with the um, game, um, you know, comparison, like uh, analogy. Um, I think, so I feel like there's so many factors though. I feel like, I guess my whole, my life journey so far is to accept, let's say my uh, quote unquote uh, weirdness or, or uh, I have this on, uh, constant ongoing uh, battle and uh, with, uh, my perceived sense of uh, quirkiness uh, and not in a hip, like, oh, I'm so weird, weird but just just this, but it's just my relationship with the world. It is just like, I guess I need to accept uh, that I'm not a universal uh, character or whatever. So, yeah, that's me. What makes you weird? Yeah, I think I've always had quite like a, a lively, uh, imagination and um i think and i don't do it intentionally but i, I kind of i can like, connect the dots in sort of weird ways and i just have i feel like my my default mode is to just uh talk word salad like if you kind of said speak how you want to speak i would just talk like yeah just like a, a random generator kind of language so a lot of life is spent i feel ch is trying to like um order myself and participate in society and that's where the game stuff comes in, I think. But then I kind of also notice that there's like uh, good sides that I'm kind of proud of and, uh, but yeah. It's really problematic when you literally have 10 tabs opening, opened at the same time. One tab is playing music, one plays like your past, one plays your present and one plays the future. <laughs> and then you have to deal with your own self in your self-consciousness, right? So a lot of times it's like learning to focus and actually do one thing at a time and to not sound incoherent while you're doing it. So that's why it's so different being an INFP, right? And you wanna be authentic, but also your imagination allows you to break every single sense of boundaries in terms of culture, in terms of like, yeah. <laughs> So in, in some ways, you're not living in the same world as other people. You're living in different timelines constantly and different realities that are good for you, ideally, but not everybody else necessarily sees what's going on in your mind. Yeah. 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 Jumping on that analogy, I, I was got the sense, especially like when I was a little older, you know, you go into like, you know, junior high and you become a little more aware of social hierarchies and dynamics and things. I always got the sense that uh, whenever they were explaining the rules, I had somehow checked out. And then suddenly, you know, you come back in and you're like, oh, I hope the teacher didn't say anything important. <laughs> and then you're too embarrassed to ask. <laughs> it's like, what just happened? I often felt that way with like, uh like sports for example like i never understood how somehow they just assumed i knew like oh don't run about don't run with the basketball for example i bear no trauma from that incident whatsoever <laughs> but yeah yeah you often just get that sense it's like like uh not so much that like oh i'm playing on hard mode but just the sense like i don't even know if i'm playing the right game in the first place so that's me. How about you, Nathan? Yeah, um, a lot of this resonates. I feel like, you know, especially with F E T E it creates those you were speaking earlier, Paul, about these boundaries, these rules, and and, and I feel like often FI is just assumed. Like if you follow these rules, this will make you happy. Whereas with an FI dumb, I feel like I'm with my FI dumb, I'm constantly questioning. Does this make me happy? Does this make me happy? To what degree, because the SI comes in, to what degree does this make me happy or not happy? So there's that constant questioning where at, when everyone else around me isn't questioning, whatever society has deemed to be good or bad, it 
it just everyone seems to want to go along with that. So it definitely seems like it's like being thrown into like a hard level, but also like a different hard level that none of the other players understand because they're playing at a different level at the same time as you. Um, but I do wonder, you know, often people play, why do people play at a hard level of, of games, right? Because they do it because it feels more rewarding. And a question I would think of, I would think of is like, okay, if we are playing at a higher level, does that mean the reward is greater too or, or not? <laughs> or their failure is just, or the failure is just as bad for us, right? Yeah. The reward is great, but the failure is as crushing. Right? Yeah. And like to what end, right? Because often with games, like I, I used to be super competitive in playing games and I would get my ego involved. Like I got to beat the hardest level just so I can prove to myself that I'm good at this game. But it's like in the game of life, does that apply? Does that even, is there that reward or is it just, you know, just ego driven? There's also this sense of, you know you're in a game but like no one else knows you're in a game so it's almost like the truman show uh, where everyone else is following the script of life and then there's that like questioning why is this important being a person who questions things in in a world where others don't always do that that can cause a lot of existential angst and existential unrest and so i often will hear infp say words like crippling like life is a little bit crippling in a sense not for all of them yeah. but maybe yeah <laughs> yeah it can be but i also want to say that i, I feel like the, there's a game inside me that is just as exciting as a natural game i feel like i have this like um arcade in, in my mind which is just as like flashy and there's like you know colors and and excitement so there's a sense of like even though it's very difficult to maneuver navigate the, the external world I, i'm in touch with like a like a, a rich, vivid, inner, like exciting life uh, as well, which I feel is really great. <laughs> like it's, it's like the best in a sense. <laughs> like, yeah, that rich inner world is really, really magnificent and luscious for sure. It's pretty um, helpful during COVID too, to have a rich inner world. You don't have to go outside to have fun necessarily. Um, but it's also like a very good, I think it, um, it, the challenges kind of help us with artistic nature because you get to see life from uh, artistic kind of perspective, right? Because you're kind of like seeing things from the from the outside, right? Not not necessarily from from the inside. So I think I think that's like an awesome thing. Yeah, I used to design games for my work, and but like I I grew up re being really into these really esoteric puzzles like there's sudokus but then there's like slitherlings and other types of like advanced sudokus that most people have never heard of so like um right off the bat like i was weird that way but i i see game design just to tie the two ideas together because you're talking about games and art i feel like game design is an art form but it's often it's not recognized as an art form within the world of art you know, within the typicals, you know, dance and painting and theater and stuff. So even there, like, I had to be an artist without being recognized as being an artist. So it's uh, definitely a uh, hard mode in both senses of the word, but it definitely provides a lot of opportunities to um, to to provide something different yeah, to society. Yeah, I've found games fascinating in the sense of how like uh the the world the inner world uh side of things and i kind of i feel like games are <sighs> i feel like there's something interesting about like a game kind of represent like imagination and like wacky worlds and, and magic but they have this kind of they're, they're like their codes and their, their, their structures and so there's something appealing to me about the kind of way that like you can kind of design a, like a meaning of life using software and like the structure of a game and so i guess you know as like a nerdy infp who's into like the idea of like you know world building and stuff in fiction there's something quite um satisfying about thinking about the rules of a world 
and yeah I kind of thought in, in terms of like how to navigate my sort of like um external life I do kind of think think of it as a game in the sense of how do I design a life that kind of accommodates me if I, if I don't fit in what does a life where I do fit in look like and that's what I kind of um that's my sort of a uh, thing uh, yeah, where does a life where you do fit in look like? It sounds like idealism a bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this reminds me of one of my big sort of underlying passions in life. It's like, how can I create a world where everyone within it can feel like they can fit it? There's space for them as well. Like that's the stuff that gets me like emotional at night. <laughs> yeah, or help create that world. Does this lead into you wanting being a leader, Nathan? You think INFPs are good leaders? Um, I think that there is a space for FI to have leadership. Yes, I do. Um, and I think that the FI component is often lacking in leadership sometimes. And I think that it's not... I don't think that, you know, FI or INFP is inherently more of a leader or should be more of a leader type than other types. But I think that currently in society, there is an imbalance where there's the lack of INFP leadership. Um, so, so it's just given the current state of affairs, you know, if, if the whole theory behind this MBTI or cognitive function stuff is so that we can balance ourselves if we choose to, if we want to, then, then how, like, that would apply on a societal level as well, where society can heal by balancing itself out. How about that? Speaking about like um, INP leadership, I think that INPs could play a really um, in, important role. I, I think it's um, we a lot of the riches that we carry are are kind of like within our head, right? We're full, we're full of riches and. Uh, it's like there's a plethora, plethora of wonderful things that are existing in our head. And if only like we could kind of like bring bring it out there for everyone else to see, I think that a lot of people would appreciate it. What are your thoughts, Paul? Yeah, I was just reflecting on that. Uh, just a couple months ago, I entered a mentorship program and where I explained to her that I wanted to develop my leadership skills. And one thing that really struck with me like right away is she asked me the question, well, what kind of leader do you want to be? And even though I was aware of it, because, you know, there's the very traditional, you know, directive managerial type leaders, she gave me a lot of space to express, uh, you know, like what I was aiming for in the leadership style. And I think, I'm not sure, I think I've heard uh, Antonia Dodge and Joel Marquette talk about it before on Personality Hacker, but they talked about INFPs leading by inspiration. There's a more of an indirect style behind them. It's basically they've, you know, once they be, once they're assuming they're healthy, they tend to, you know, be very committed to their ideals, and then they might, you know, use their any and at times te to express it in the world, and it pulls people in. They're like, oh wow, like this person is really focused on something, and like I want to be, I want to be a part of this world that they're committed to, and yeah, they they just have that kind of they might be a bit more remote than some leaders, but at the same time, it's like, okay, well, this person is here and these are the values they're committed to. And I, I, I want to share these values with this person. And yeah, I think they can be very influential on that scale. Uh, I was just, when uh, Paul was talking about that, I was uh, reminded of uh, George Lucas because he, I think he's a really great example of an INFP leader. Uh, and when he was first directing, uh, people didn't even know that he was the director because he was like so quiet. <laughs> so he just, they just thought he was like this this background guy working in the background. And it, it I, I I thought it was like um, I kind of forgot the name of the the character who played uh, Princess Leia, but she, she she spoke about that. She said like by the third day they figured out that she, that he's a director. <laughs> so, so there's this trope around like I don't know. Power Rangers or just group uh, superhero team tropes about there being like a, um, a member who's like the, the heart of the kind of team who's not like maybe the, the like strongest or, or toughest, but um, yeah, like, yeah, just inspires everyone. 
Um, and I, I guess maybe that's a maybe kind of INFP thing potentially. And I, I kind of wonder because I, yeah, I, I get the, and I, I get this from other INFPs of just, of like um, the kind of the potential to inspire, but from my, the INFPs that I know and with myself, it's hard. So for me, if I have any kind of, um, let's say ability to inspire, it's kind of unintentional. And so I, I, I guess it's the kind of thing that people react to that I wouldn't know how to leverage or to turn into something that I could, you know, be a leader type person. Um, I, I guess I just tend to do my thing. And that may influence um, other people. Well, yeah, I mean, I do agree with this kind of inspiration, but I think at least for me, I'm a four, five, one, actually. I'm actually not a four, five, nine. Um, because I think the one is the terms of like wanting to be right and actually like accuracy and research. Um, but, but I think, uh, at least for me, a lot of people, when they perceive me, a lot of, uh, people have thought I was, I was like an INTP for a while. Right. Um, because actually I wasn't afraid to share my thoughts and because I'm into philosophy, I can understand philosophical frameworks of like organizations or within cultures and exactly like what is the root values of certain organizations. So I kind of grew up often thinking, well, first questioning things and also questioning why things weren't ideal for like everyone and why were people feeling left out and why are people, why are groups themselves not getting along together and trying to understand these different groups and, and, and recognizing like I didn't fit in to these different groups. So therefore, how can I create an organization in which these different groups will actually get along with one another and get to know one another? Because I think for INFPs, a lot of times it's like, we feel like we're misunderstood all the time like constantly because we know ourselves so well. So how can we actually get other people to be understood? Because we can see when people don't feel like they're part of the group, right? And 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 I think it saddens us in, in some ways. So in, in some sense, we look for the ideal of what an organization could be. I mean, some INFPs just like go along and just do their own thing, right? But I guess like for me, it was always like, how can I reform things? And how can I also be an example of change within a place, right? Like how can I be um, a servant leader, for example, um, or a person who listens to people and actually like cares about people deeply as like a leader and not one that just, you know, tells people what to do um, or just delegates constantly or, or just pretends to be something that they're not, right? So I think like these ideals that I always have, I these are deals that I had since I was a child. And I wish that other leaders and other like adult figures would actually get to know me as a person, right? Um, so I think these things have been projected since I was like a child to like who I am as an adult today. And they inform like everything that I do in the way that I communicate with other people. But um, often, I think when people see this, they're like, okay, this is a person that actually has thought this through for a long period of time. And, you know, they're not just, uh, they're not just doing it for their own fame and fortune. They're not just doing it because you, they just want people to ple uh, praise them or, or to see that they are like, like, a, like a popular person or a person that just says whatever is um in tune with the culture or yeah someone that's authentic so that really resonated with me and especially when you said the word listening and are people listening um and for me it's like it's one thing to hear someone and what the contents of what they're saying it's another thing to hear like the feeling tone the fi content of, of what when of someone uh whether they're talking or not and i think that often in groups the culture says that as a group we'll deal with practical matters but in terms of like fi stuff or your emotions 
well, you're just supposed to deal with that on an individual level. Like you just, just deal with it. Um, versus a type of group that I would, you know, that I would, that I'm trying to create, for instance, it's, it's one where like we can, we can combine our FI and, and make it a group matter and make it one where we, we are listening to each other on a, on a feeling level. Yeah. Yeah. So there seems to be in this theme of inclusivity, but it's on honoring the individuals in, in an organizational environment and honoring who they are as people. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. And so Kevin, what are your thoughts? Well, I noticed that um, the listening aspect of INFP, um, I'm, I actually got my brain scanned by Dr. Dario Nardi. And then I saw like, you know, the, the high levels of activity right behind the ears. So when I hear everyone talking about listening to people, listening to people, I'm like, yeah, listening is kind of, I feel like our superpower. Uh, I don't know if that you guys also feel the same way, but well, now that I'm like a little more aware of uh, listening to other people's tones of voices, I can kind of really tell if they're being authentic or not authentic or how they feel. And then like, I take that feeling and it just like goes inside me and it's like, it's nothing I can do about it. I just like empathize and stuff. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> And oh, Martin, you look like you want oh, to say something. Um, yeah, I feel like listening is our superpower, but it's also like our biggest hurt and our biggest pain. Because when people say things, like it just gets into our ears and we can repeat it over and over. So it's really, it's very difficult as well too, right? Like it's it's both a superpower, but it's it, it's a cause for our deepest pain. And, um, but also, Another thing about people's voices, I, I, I think um, INFPs, we, we really know how to use our voices and modulate our voices because we're so aware of ourselves. So actually, I think we can be really great public speakers. Um, and on another note, I find it really intriguing with INFP singers because they use their voice in such like a musical way, like such a musical quality, like it's... um like a violin, like with violin, there's like vibrato, for example. And we ourselves, like, I think with a lot of INFPs, like, like Tom York, Tom, Tom York, I believe, like the way that he uses his voice, it's like so unique. It's so unlike many other singers. And we really like that uniqueness. So I think our voices and how we hear other people's voices, we pick up a lot of information constantly from from people and then we decipher that information in a way in which we can kind of um hone and narrow down to the basic uh substance of like people's souls right and, and we can read that um and that's not to say like other types can't do that as well too they can pick up that uh but i think INFPs are good with using their voices yeah yeah using the word soul is a very nf catalyst language so linda barons she talks about how the nf types are called catalysts or kirsi calls them the idealists and they often use abstract words to describe people like using the word soul that's like a it's an nf thing <laughs> anyways um martin also brought up singers who are INFPs. So I'm wondering, what are some fictional or real life examples of INFPs that you all know about? Say like John Mayer can be, I'm, I'm interpreting him as possibly INFP references for an INFP. Well, you know, you know that, yeah, it kind of makes me think, actually the only INFP that I know in a public eye are drag queen INFPs on that same note. So. I mean, I really, I really appreciate um, Robert Patterson. I think he's a phenomenal actor. Um, I think he can really channel like emotions. Um, but yeah, like I, I find it interesting, like some INFP fictional characters, I feel like I don't relate with them like almost at all, <laughs> right? Yeah, it, it's just so interesting how the anagram kind of changes like these archetypes, right? And, but um, like Luna Lovegood, I don't really relate with her. Maybe on like some 
abstract level in my mind, but like, I don't, I don't uh, project that outwards like ever, right? Like I, I know how people would perceive me, I guess, if I did that, but also, yeah, I guess I'm more pragmatic as an INFP than some INFPs, yeah. Yeah, I would love to be like s smooth and and qu quirky, like with like Luna Lovegood has that, like, oh, I'm this uh, eccentric fairy person who's cool. I, I kind of feel and like mysterious, kind of. And I, I don't, I, I think I'm too neurotic to kind of uh, have that kind of persona. Um, I'm too erratic and neurotic. Um, but uh, one INFP that came to mind to have seen people say that is an INFP is the, uh, I forgot his name, the first Spider-Man, uh, the first oh. actor who played Peter Parker. Toby Maguire, yeah. Toby Maguire, that's one. And in real life, I, I guess I've, I've, yeah, I've heard um, just uh, the, like, uh, Andrew Holland, the act, not Andrew Holland, uh, Andrew Garfield, the actor, is an INFP. Oh, so Joyce, the reason why there was a long silence after your uh, your question is because it's really hard to come up with uh, very public INFPs. <laughs> Usually we're hiding somewhere. And also, again, like um, we're not a user-friendly kind of avatar. So like kind of like making it out into the world like in a successful way is not like not not quite a thing. But so I had to like really think about it. I made a list where well, there's like um, George Lucas. Oscar Wilde, I know some people say ENFP, but I could say INFP. Um, Audrey Hepburn, and we have also Kierkegaard too. And I think like a running theme is um, when INFPs could actually, um, 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 if when, I, when, when INFPs could actually kind of um, get their stuff out there into the world, um, they're able to create material that is really rich and powerful in a way that it's relatable to others, like be able to communicate a message that could really resonate with a lot of people, like like when you look at George Lucas and how he communicated like the the archetypes of human experiences, right? So I would say like for example, there could be like a bit more like famous INTPs who make it around in the academic world, but it's kind of hard to read what they what they write. But like for INTPs, it's like it, um, when in a rare case they actually make it out into the world. Um, in, in that sort of way that they keep make something that's really relatable. Yeah. I wonder if it's the SE polar that causes the difficulty of putting yourself out there or being an NP in general. NP. We're talking, we don't have any problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. George R. R. Martin. I have no idea, but that's a famous INFP who's out there apparently. Um, yeah, I was just <laughs> kind of go through, going through my SI files, <laughs> trying to recall everyone ever mentioned. Uh, I think mus musically, I'd say Bjork. Let's see. I, I think I've mentioned this before, Joyce, uh, but Bill Watterson, the creator of Calvin and Hobbes, is considered by many to be an INFP. Uh, and then, yeah, other fictional ones. I think various interpretations of Anne Shirley from Anne of Green Gables. Sometimes she's an ENFP, but it kind of depends on the portrayal. Uh, Frodo Baggins, fictional, yeah. I'm actually of the mind, <laughs> Martin, you mentioned Luna Lovegood. I'm personally of the mind that she's an INTP, but I can see, I can definitely see the, the merit in INFP for her. And I have no problem with her being an INFP personally, because I think she's pretty great. Here's another INFP. Fiona Apple, the singer, yeah. She's great, I love her music, yeah. Yeah, uh, Paul, you just reminded me, I've, I kind of like read, like Alice in, um, Alice in Wonderland, Alice Adventures in Wonderland. When I read that book, I was like, oh, I feel strangely heard by this character who's constantly questioning, I, I guess there are parts, I guess there's a whole like, logic thing and maybe she could be an INTP or something but it's also kind of a constant questioning of like, I don't know, identity and things in that character as well. So I kind of feel like, yeah, Alice in the in the books, at least is an INFP or could be one. Kevin, you look like you want to say something. <laughs> yeah, so I got the, um, 
We're all forgetting one of the um, most important INFPs in the Myers Briggs world. Isabel Briggs Myers. Isabel Briggs Myers. Yeah. 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 One the creator of the MBTI. Uh, which I think uh, I can kind of segue into like introverted feeling in the leading role or dominant role. Uh, she was a woman in the like 1960s who made this when women weren't even like really working or they were seen as like so it's pretty amazing what uh, introverted feeling can do when it comes out in the world and levels up enough then you get this like this sort of thing shakespeare that's possibly a good example too so i'm wondering what is everyone's experience with being a male but also being very emotional or maybe even seen in, as feminine for some of you sometimes or seeing yourself as a little bit relating to a few more feminine traits. Yeah, so I have, hmm. So, I don't know, so in terms of, hmm, I had to even talk about it. So uh, for a start, so you know, um, so I'm a queer person and as a child, I kind of constantly had um, things that people pointed out to me were effeminate and sort of, you know, made fun of like, you know, being called gay and, and everything. And so, so there's that, like the kind of ways that I found naturally, uh, the kind of, uh, the ways of expression that I found natural to me were often sort of called gay or, um, you know, effeminate and everything. And I think, you know, and I think, yeah, there's a trauma that comes from that. But I think as an, you know, getting older, I've, I've, I've I've learned to sort of embrace and love and be in touch with that. And I think I have a sort of like, maybe it's still kind of a resentment against the idea of like um, maleness or manhood. Cause I feel like it's sort of like, uh, I feel like it's something that's usually been imposed um, onto me. And um, if, if there is um, some like genuine uh, madness or masculinity um, I'm, you know, I'd like to explore that, but not, there's so many other things attached to it that I don't like. And yeah, I'm, so yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm eager to, to, to lean into the femininity because I guess it's back, for me, it's back to kind of uh, getting back to the side of myself that as a child that was expressive, but then the stuff at one point. So yeah, so femininity, uh, femininity for me is kind of tied to a sense of um, authenticity. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll take a crack. Yeah, I definitely, I didn't so much notice it as a child because I was fairly active. Like I loved playing outside and, you know, I'd pretend to be a dinosaur. So I'd like stomp around the playground making noises and stuff. And, you know, kids generally take that kind of thing in stride. <laughs> but yeah, definitely the older I got, uh, except for I would notice, like, you know, I didn't like it when, like, other boys roughhoused as much. It was like, oh, what, wow, they're being too rough. And it's like, they think this is funny to throw rotten logs at each other. And <laughs> which which was, like, done in fun. They weren't even, like, fighting. But they, they just thought it was a game. And that terrified me. I just, like, wanted to sit down with a book. Uh, but I do remember, and I think we've kept this pretty... Uh, PG so far, Joyce, but uh, I do remember in grade six, Kelly Reynolds uh, specifically said to me, Paul, why are you so fucking girlish? And I didn't have an answer for that. Like, I just felt like, you know, like, well, I felt like I was going to cry for one. So that really uh, helped my case there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was just, I think it tied into the fact that, yeah, I had no interest or aptitude for sports so just in a more uh you know physical expression uh i didn't know what was cool i had no idea you know i just like dressed however i didn't like dress in like an overly feminine way but i didn't dress in anything considered trendy or whatever uh and yeah it was just generally the fact that you know i'd i'd just get very sensitive and i'd like I'd find myself shutting down whenever, you know, things got rowdy in the classroom, things like that. So that, I think that's where really when it started to sink home. Uh, yeah. The worst part is, is I didn't really relate to a, like a lot of the things that girls were into either. So, uh, 
you know, like I had no interest in like fashion trends, for example, or, you know, things like that. So it's like, oh my God, like what is wrong with me? Like I, yeah, you, you feel, at least I certainly felt very alienated at that stage. I think I'll kind of, I'll try to break, not intentionally the stereotypes of when INFP male can be, but I mean, I was, I was actually quite aggressive as a kid. I mean, I was quiet sometimes and, and I could be shy, but with my friends, like we wrestled one another sometimes. Like I knew them really well though. And a lot of them were FI doms, right? Like ISFPs and stuff and like ISTPs and INFJ. But I mean, we, we had fun. Like, and also sometimes like we made fun of other kids. Like we weren't always like really nice, but we also made fun of kids that were like really mean, <laughs> right? Or like, or like really rebellious. And like they thought they could do anything they wanted or like were really prideful, right? So I, I I mean, I feel like I had, it sounds like I'm justifying myself, which I am, but but what I'm saying is like, I don't think, I don't think the INFP male is as passive as people think we are, right? And people don't understand the amount of hurt that we can actually cause other people as well too, right? But at the same time, I was very sensitive. Like I would cry over things and, and people would be like, where, where did this come from? Like, where did this emotion come from? Um, or I could appear like I just didn't care at all because in fact, I didn't care like about other things that were going on or even people around me. Like I remember one time I was on the bus and this girl, she, she told me like, just straight up like Martin, why? why don't you ever say anything? Why are you so shy? And I was just like, because I'm total, like, I'm busy first thing in my own world. And second thing is you guys are all like really mean <laughs> and you guys are uh, jerks and I don't want to talk. Right. Um, but yeah, like I remember, uh, yeah, like I didn't care about fashion. I remember the first time someone in the class actually pointed out that um, I was wearing this blue shirt underneath because literally m when I woke up in the morning, my mom would just put a sweater on top of me and I just go to school, right? So then she noticed it's like, why are you wearing that shirt all the time? And then in my mind, like my childhood kind of blew up because I started realizing, recognizing like, oh, people will judge how I look, right? Therefore I have to put on different types of clothes. I need to uh, look presentable, right? In order for people to not judge me. Right. So I, I, I vividly, I vividly remember that. Um, but I think it's interesting because I feel like as I matured around 20 years old and up, like I started relating so much more with women, partly because a lot of girls didn't hang out with guys back then, maybe of, for different reasons, but, but um, I started embracing more of my feeling side because I realized a lot of men weren't as deep feeling as we are, right? Um, I wouldn't, so I, I really think that um, how men are portrayed in this culture today is very different than what it was like during the Renaissance or even some type of African cultures. And I'll describe this as like this idea of um introverted feeling but like portraying it uh, in your clothing like for example uh during the renaissance men wore very extravagant clothing right very feminine clothing right but we don't describe that as feminine back then because that's what they wore right or even in some african cultures uh men would wear lipstick or or they would wear uh like very decorative clothing. And even in the animal kingdom, you see that male uh, uh, types of animals are the ones that have big manes or like guppies, for example, they have very decorative uh, tails and things like that. So, so this idea, I think it's more of a modern conception that, that men themselves can't uh, express these elaborate emotions in the outward kind of way 
it's more of a recent thing, right? And and it's actually probably more of a Western thing, um, where like, yeah, we wear like muted colors, we wear grays, blues, and like you know, other colors like that. But yeah, that's that's just how I tend to think about um, sexuality, right? Or or how we express our 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 gender identity and things like that. Sorry, that was really long. I hope that actually made sense. It totally made sense. Yeah. How about Kevin, if you want to share? Well, my experience growing up is just it, it's all pretty invisible because that's kind of what culture is. I uh, just uh, Western culture, all these signs from my parents, media, uh, on TV, whatever's going on, just like men are this way. And if they're not this way, then consequences. Like it's, I've heard a lot of you speak of like when people are just like, why are you so quiet? Or like, why are you so this? Or why are you so that? So same with like being quiet. Um, men are not supposed to be quiet. You got to be like the alpha male. You got to be out there. So um, I noticed this when I was younger, maybe like, a little bit into high school that like some, something needed to change. So then I kind of just on a whim put on a different mask for the, for like the next 10 years. It was kind of, it's kind of wild. So I just kind of took all those sensitive sides, sensitive quiet sides of myself and just like put them, put them away, put, put them away quietly. Yeah. And I think one of the other qualities of INFPs that adds to this is sometimes society requires you for dating to kind of initiate and be the one who talks to the female first and does all the first moves, like being the front forward person, the aggressor. So that kind of role, I find that some INFP males might find that to be difficult or they have to kind of consciously do it as in like their normal impulse is to kind of like wait for girls to come to them. But like the modern dating realm is more about you going to approach them. Or, you know, it depends if you're straight, that is. Uh, but if you're gay, it's, a, it's like the same thing, but with the, the gender you're attracted to. I, I guess I want to say, um, to add to that is, I think um, the tendency and inclination is for me to want people to approach me, but I, I do find, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, it's one of my sort of growing points of like, uh, uh, like agency and um you know being kind of proactive and and actually even though like i'm not dating currently i for some reason i i believe that my like um fi will propel me to approach the person that i'm attracted to um even if generally that i don't do that um also i i just wanted to add about the the like sports stuff and gender things i kind of feel like as an um i don't know fi any person i have the potential to be interested in so many different things and and I am but I kind of feel that those sort of like gender roles and labels kind of pre uh, prevented the exploration of that so as an adult I found that I could be into like um you know sports well you know some sports you know I I, I can be into fashion I can I can be into all, all kinds of things like yeah between uh you know categories on this topic of like um, um, uh, INFP and being male, so like when you're an INFP and you're you're male, like I, at least in my experience, like probably like um, I felt like very much like out of place, and maybe I thought maybe like because society's feeding kind of images, you kind of at a certain level you kind of buy into that, right? But then afterwards, because you know you kind of feel like so out of the box that eventually like you could almost like treat it like a game like you could you need to go like um oh i want to i i feel like these archetypically uh masculine things are kind of cool and these archetypically feminine things are kind of cool too i might as well just like mash it up in my own way in a way that i think it's fun i want to relate with someone who's like uh, really masculine then i know how to i know how to act right <laughs> if so it's just like i i don't know i just it's just kind of like allows um uh, me to at least think outside the box. Well put, well put. And Nathan? Yeah, I find that mainstream culture, especially among people who don't know about personality type, often conflates gender with F and T. Um, and I think that I got when I first learned about, you know, personality theory, I got so excited for so many reasons. One of them being this idea that, you know, I can be an F male um, and that they're different. And, you know, you could be whatever gender you'd like to be. 
and also have your F or T preference. You could be a, a female um, T, you could be a, a non-binary F, you could be a male T or F or whatever you choose to be, which is great. Yeah, I find FI has a wild side to it often and usually it gets expressed through any, but sometimes it gets expressed through SI. And it's a bit contradictory because SI can be very restrictive, but when FI feels it, it kind of like, I think non-INFPs can sometimes be surprised when we show that side of ourselves where the S gets a little bit crazy. Yeah, I'll, I'll do an example of how my FI, SI went kind of crazy. Well, I, I don't know. So I really enjoy doing stand-up sometimes. So as a chaplain, um, I do this thing where I introduce myself. And at one point in front of like everyone in this organization, well, like, so we have people that live in this, in uh, the Salvation Army in this organization, and they're part of this like rehabilitation program and like treatment program and stuff. And I was trying to introduce myself in like very creative new ways, right? So at one point I called myself, I said that I was, um, uh, Pac-Man Martin instead of like Cha Chaplain Martin. So I started actually doing this like Pac-Man thing, like womp, 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 womp. And I did this around the room. Like, and for me, I don't care, like, because for me, I'm comfortable with myself, right? And I'm in my own little world, right? And then I did this in front of my coworkers and and, and they're, they were so embarrassed. And it was fun actually watching them being embarrassed because I'm not embarrassed. And I know that people are enjoying this and I'm making fun of myself and I'm being lighthearted, right? So in, in some ways, like FI is so strong sometimes that, yeah, I mean, like sometimes we just don't care whether people feel and, but also like we know that if they're enjoying something and they're experiencing something that we are experiencing in our own minds, we, I, I, th I feel like we, we get a lot of joy from that. When, we can finally give people like a glimpse, maybe a, a tiny little glimpse of like what goes on in our mind, in our own world. And that's what I think sparks our passion, right? That's what really um, drives us when we can share that amazing uh, deep part of ourselves, right? And, and people enjoy that as well too, or have fun with it, yeah. Yeah, like, if I may, uh, I always keep thinking about how can I be more present in the world and how can I show up more fully? And even for like this, for instance, uh, I was giving advice, you know, just be yourself, be authentic, you know? And I think that, um, I think there are, it, it can be challenging, like we were saying earlier about the hard level game mode, but I think if we feel comfortable enough and we're in that zone where we're swept away with our passion, it can be like electric. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. What are you all passionate about? So what does get you into a flow? What gets you into feeling the most you or the most energized? I feel like there's like a million things <laughs> that we're passionate about <laughs> and we want to combine it into like one. Yeah, this sounds so I, I I'm actually really passionate about like listening to people. It sounds really cheesy, but I I really enjoy like listening to people's stories and then like encountering like a different world other than my own. And and that's why I think INFPs have such a love for narrative because we find so many things in life really boring. Um but I find people fascinating, even though if I don't agree with like most people in general, or I, or even that sometimes I just tolerate a lot of people in general. Um, I really enjoy sharing my different ideas that I've been thinking about for long periods of time, because I usually don't share it with anybody. Um, I'm not married or anything, so, but yeah, but I, I can even imagine if I was married, there's just some thoughts and ideas that seem so abstract that I want to share it in different ways, whether artistically or through like poetry. Um, 
where they can encounter the emotion and the the theme more than perhaps what it seems like on a surface level. Um, I'm really, I mean, as always, like I'm passionate about like talking about different types of nerdy or geeky kind of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of friends and I'm, I'm passionate about knowing them. Right. <laughs> like, and that, and, and it sounds really creepy, but like really knowing them, like on their deepest level, right? Like, what are their their greatest joys or their greatest sorrows? Just like some of the most most insignificant things about them, um, I'm ha passionate about like spending time with them, uh, and and talking to them about myself and knowing about them as well. Um, I don't know. I'm passionate about learning. I'm always really thirsty about learning things, and I feel like these things are all kind of pretty universal. To a lot of INFPs, yeah. I th yeah, I think I think Martin has a really good point about learning. I think um, that's a great, really great thing to get us into our into our zone, kind of outside of the introvert feeling, introvert sensing kind of rut. Like um, because um, at at one level, the world can seem like a really stressful place, especially with the expectations that are, are placed upon us. But when we kind of look, see it from like a learning kind of mindset, kind of like um, lead with a bit of extra intuition, just come from a place of just being very curious about things, curious about others, curious about how how the world is like, then that's like um, that could really drive us out into the world in a way that in a way that's comfortable for us. Well put. And I guess our next topic is self-expression. You could all comment on your flow state as well, but like perhaps we could also talk about how do you self-express? If you want to share or what does it mean to you <laughs> i was just thinking not <laughs> talking <laughs> no um joyce well, this is such a personal well, matter to us well, We're not gonna share. <laughs> well while we think of the an answer for that can i answer the previous question <laughs> yeah answer? yeah all right. Sure. all right so um so i kind of hinted at one of my passions before in terms of like how can we reorganize society or the systems that we have in order to you know serve people better um and for me one of these systems that i would love to make an impact on one day is education and it relates to what martin and leon were talking about in terms of learning in terms of the joy of learning and and that's something that i really i feel like I have, and a lot of people have, but I feel like our education system doesn't doesn't always foster that. Um, it often does, but sometimes it could be lacking, at least from my experience, and because it becomes a bit more of a means to an end rather than an end in of itself, for, for other reasons, uh, including that one. Um, so yeah, that's uh, one of my passions in, in terms of like how I could maybe one day make an impact. Yeah. But now we can talk about how we express ourselves. <laughs> I want to yeah. I want to add to I want to add to what Nathan said. Uh, so I want I want to quote uh, Linda Barons and Dario Nardi. Uh, this is a description of the introverted feeling in the leading role or dominant role. They continually weigh the universal worth or importance of everything. They approach life first from a point of view of what is really important and of value. It is as if they have a whole range of values in mind and see the subtle distinctions in the relative worth of different actions, people, thoughts, and feelings, groups, and causes. They continually examine choices to see if they match their inner value system and intent, often easily deciding if something is of significance and worth believing in. They mull over major choices, evaluating with, it, with deep intensity until they feel ready to make a decision. Where they place belief, it is 100%. So I want to hear like Nathan talk about education and then there's like a lot behind the scenes. That's like why this is important. He's like, this, 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 this. And then all you really see is just just one part. Like, hey, like education, I like that. That's cool. We should make that better. <laughs> but then it, on the inside, there's like so much that goes behind thinking, why is this important? Yes, I have a 50 page outline for a book that I want to write one day, which 
goes in more in depth into my philosophies about education, but in typical INFP fashion, it's still on the on the back burner. <laughs> wow, you must have been really traumatized by the education process. <laughs> um, to a certain degree, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll admit that. Yeah, um, that's the only way that we, that we would really want to like change things. But yeah. Um, and, wait, Joyce, what was your question? I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> I, mean, how, I, I can I can give an answer, perhaps. Um, I'll, I'm gonna um, speak up for the nerds and say one of the ways I express myself is through spreadsheets, because spreadsheets can change the world and spreadsheets rock okay i i dig into my si there and it's got some any as well and of course some te but uh they can do more than you think they can there we go one of the things that i kind of think about is uh maybe it's like what to let go of in in si or whatever when it comes to expression because i've been i have this chart like this identity as like um yeah and kind of tied with learning as, as like a, a reader. So um, when I was, yeah, really young, I, I was sort of like, a, I like devoured books and I had this identity as someone who, yeah, um, liked to read and wanted to write. And I think I, I've i tried to like throw myself at the at the wall or bang my head against a brick wall or whatever to try to kind of be a writer when it kind of didn't, uh, it, the, the process of writing felt uh, very, um, it was like pulling teeth, um, it was painful. And so I've, I've kind of, had this sort of obsession or of trying to find like a, a mode of expression or creativity that works and kind of fits me perfectly. And um, I guess I've reconciled that by combining everything, all the bits and pieces I know about everything that I know, and then maybe being creative about being creative. But I guess the appealing thing, thing about being creative for me is just the idea that I can give this sort of like whatever's happening, like the like the, the wacky world up here, it could kind of take like form uh, in on on externally. And that's what I like about um, art and creativity. But sometimes I'm like, oh, my true like passion or whatever is just being with, with people, <laughs> like maybe of like, uh, sometimes I kind of wrestle with that of just like um, to allow myself to develop friendships because on one level, I feel like the most happy when like I, I'm laughing with uh, friends or I'm like with people who are kind of um, playful and expressive and we can like um, mirror each other in that sense. And for me, that's a great feeling, but because of my sort of um, uh, introverted, uh, I don't know, hermit tendencies, I don't give myself as much of that as I would like really, because I'm naturally, oh, let me research things. And, you know, so yeah. I think um, self-expression is kind of a, a strange thing for an IP in a way because there's a lot of like um, drama stirring within, but on the outside, it's like it's it's not very apparent right? to the to the outside world. Um, people can't really see it, so they see someone who's like um, kind of more stoic on the outside, right? But the inside is is like a very tumultuous world, and it's filled with words and images that are really hard to communicate kind of find a medium for that, right? So I guess like when it comes to to my work in terms of my writing, I try to find a way to connect people with their in, inner world, to kind of get them in touch with um, what they're feeling inside and um, and also uh, become aware of their, how, how they could, how, how they could heal their pain. So I know like, I have a sense, I have this belief that even though we're all very different, there's a lot of uh, universal processes that, that we all have. Like there's the universal human condition. And and I feel like it's like really important to be able to express what that universal human condition is and to take everyone through like a healing journey through um, their suffering. Yeah, that spoke to my heart. Anyone else want to share their relationship with self-expression? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a crack. And yeah, it's funny because this kind of ties in with uh, the your last question too, Joyce, about uh, things that are passionate about. So I guess two things I'm both passionate about and utilize in my self-expression are humor and sexuality, uh, which I think are really interesting because they are extremely, they're both extremely individual and at the same time universal. 
And you can't necessarily explain like, well, why is this funny? Or why do I find this attractive? And uh, yeah, tying, tying into that aspect of like, we don't often share or we don't often fully express ourselves to, you know, the outside world. Uh, I think the part I found definitely with humor is I have a very dark sense of humor. Uh, that said, I have a very light sense of humor too, because I like love like silly puns and uh, which I'm sure Joyce has no idea what I'm talking about when I say that. Uh, and by the way, Nathan with spreadsheets, one can truly excel. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I had to, I'm sorry. But one thing I really enjoyed as I got older with humor is when I started sharing like really dark humor it w and my intention was never to offend or hurt people, but I actually enjoyed the fact that like I played with people's expectations because I was quiet, because I tended to blend into the background and, you know, just mind my own business. And then sometimes I'd come up with a comment about something and it was never to shock people, but it was because something I personally think was funny. So I was like, well, I want to see if what other people think. And <laughs> And sometimes people laugh, and sometimes you offend even the ENTPs. <laughs> but uh, I really enjoyed that, and uh, and because like I love like exploring like different stand-up comedians, and especially now with YouTube, like there's like this whole other arena we have for you know you know d different people who wouldn't necessarily you know you wouldn't necessarily see them in a comedy club for example, that I love to follow and see the ideas they're playing with. And it's beautiful, so wonderfully creative. And, and that ties with, with the sexuality thing, because I often notice, like, you know, when I'd, you know, become intimate with someone because they thought like, oh, you know, he's just like a nice person and he just seems quiet and stuff. And then you find out, <laughs> now granted, I didn't just like throw, you know, launch things on people or anything, but it ties, it's like that trope of like, you know, the straight laced librarian. And then after hours, <laughs> the hair comes down. Uh, and, and I do have to say that because, uh, because I find sexuality, especially in Western culture, is something that a lot of people are still like very uncomfortable sharing. And, and I personally believe that you shouldn't have to talk about sexuality unless you personally feel comfortable. Uh, but I find there's so much potential for healing there because it's, you know, finding new ways to connect with people. And I've been in therapy off and on since I was in my 20s. And I've generally felt comfortable with various therapists because I know why we're there and stuff. But I never really talked about sexuality until my current therapist. And it was because we just ca like I casually made a sex joke. And something very, very tame too. I don't even remember what it was, but she laughed, you know, and then she came back with one of her own. And we actually just made like, you know, stupid sex puns, you know, for a while, <laughs> you know, talking about the climax of our session together. And at the end of it, I asked if it was good for her too. Uh, but because we had that connection, I have opened up more than any other therapist before. And like, like just, to get serious for a minute, like it actually really uncovered like some trauma I'd gone through that I hadn't even thought about for 19 years. Uh, and yeah, because because of those two things, because the, the potential humor has to both, and, and sexuality has to both express our individuality, but also to connect to other people and just let go of some of the pain we might be hanging on to either whether by laughing at something or by saying, oh, hey, you know, like, well, I'm into that too. You know, you, you know you're know, you not some you know, weirdo. I mean, you're a weirdo, but you're my kind of weirdo. Um, I just think it's a wonderfully beautiful avenue of expression. So that's a, it's a long uh, <laughs> rambling story there. So I apologize for that, but yeah, that's me. We should stop apologizing as INFPs. <laughs> I, I, I actually, I think we do it too much just because we think that we care about what other people think about us, but in fact, we really don't. <laughs> um, but yeah. um, how do we express ourselves? Gosh, I don't know. I don't. I don't think. I, I think verbal is really minimum. 
Like, I think we can say it out, but we want people to experience and feel what we're going through. I mean, I, I express myself through poetry, through writing predominantly the most. Um, and, and sometimes I actually don't want people to know what's going on in my mind, right? And maybe this is like kind of, kind of contradictory because I want people to understand me, but at the same time, sometimes I kind of enjoy my world, right? <laughs> it's really selfish of me to do that. But, but sometimes I find that a lot of people don't, I would, they don't care about the things, things I care about and they don't value the things I value and care about. So why should I have to share anything about myself, right? Sometimes, but, but with people, I do value or that I think that they will care about what I care about. I will share, right? So I don't know, I'm, I'm quite, I'm very closed off in fact with a lot of people in general. Um, and only when those slivers of humor that slip out that Paul kind of talk about, people are like, man, you are actually like nuts. Like, you're crazy. And I'm like, yeah, I am. That's why I don't talk that much, right? Um, and I think the the reason why we don't express ourselves, I think it's from childhood. It's when people have rejected us, like we've had, we have tons of memories of people rejecting our thoughts and feelings, our ideas and stuff. And maybe we would have been an ENFP if people actually did accept us, right? And, and kind of enjoy those things. But the reason why we don't express ourselves is because um, what we are planning or what we're dreaming up isn't ready. And also there's, there's this part of ourselves where we don't want to share it because it's so precious to us. That's like a gem that it's too intimate and we don't want like people like stepping on that. Right. Like you don't throw pearls to a swine. Right. Um, I'm not saying all people are pigs, which they are. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but but we feel that way sometimes, right? We, we feel like people those don't get it. And when people actually do get it, we have to do it in such a way that um, allows people to enter into our crazy imaginative worlds and, and then they'll get it, right? Then they'll kind of enjoy it, but they'll probably know nothing about me. Like, because my personal details of my life, they, it's not that important. I'm actually a pretty boring person. I'm just really interesting in here. Right. And that's probably the beauty that you really need to see. Right. Because, um, because yeah, that's the, the essence of me. Thank you, Martin, for that share, because like, it got me to think like, I should approach my own world with a little bit more curiosity and with a fresh perspective, like I used to when I was younger. And I feel like, you know, it's gotten a bit stale. So I need to revisit that. And I think, and thank you, Joy, so much for this question, because often I think about, you know, I keep thinking to myself, turn your pain into purpose, turn your pain into purpose. But then, and then I think how, and I think, and now I realized, okay, expressing myself is one of those ways where I can do that. Um, and uh, that's where, um, that's where it can sort of like unfold itself. And, um, and, you know, I often think, yes, INFPs were misunderstood or people think they understand us, but they don't um, because they understand us on a certain level that we're looking for. And I think that that ties into expression as well. And, and like something I'm telling myself is if, well, if Nathan, if you want to be more understood, you should express yourself a bit more <laughs> and be a little, a little less afraid to do so. Um, so they kind of go hand in hand. Um, and yeah, there we go. <laughs> Wonderfully put. And so Kevin, do you have anything you would like to add to the topic? Um, let's see, in terms of expressing myself, I guess what I've been, what I've recently been into is, um, cooking. Like I do believe health is important. Uh, so when I do cook for other people, I try to make it as healthy as possible. Vegetarian, just like, um, really do put my own, um, flavor of my personality I guess into the cooking by um, when I when I prepare it or cut it or make it or even the act of um, I've been really 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 into um, Zen Buddhist philosophies recently 
And a part of that is just like, um, like living each moment completely present. So when you cook or you clean, you're just present and you're doing it. So um, currently that's kind of like what I've been um, or how I've been expressing myself. Yeah, yeah. With introverted feeling, I noticed that it very often puts its unique flavor or unique touch or unique signature on things. Sometimes you can tell something was made by a certain FI user because they just have that flair to what they do. With Kevin, for instance, sometimes he's super high tech and sometimes he'll put words in his background. I think he's, uh, are you doing it right now? Because <laughs> I see you looking to the side. And oh, yeah, yeah, he, he does stuff like that. Like and subscribe. Oh, that's so amazing. I love it. Yeah, and it's the Kevin touch the things because no one else does that within our class. Yeah, and, and so sometimes I notice FI will do that. Like an example is sometimes a unique flair could be noticed by like, you know, they'll change the name tag a little bit like to something that suits their taste a little bit more. There's a distinctness to FI, a unique fingerprint. So like with Paul, his puns are very Paul. You can tell a part of his personality from his puns. And so before we end the panel, I'm wondering about all of your experiences with the functions. So Kevin gave a wonderful description of introverted feeling that was from Linda Behrens a little earlier. And so I'm wondering, how would you all define FI in your experience? How do you experience FI? Uh, how about um, levels of feeling, layers and layers of feeling um, and I don't know if you want me to give a concrete example, but one that comes to mind is like, I'm deciding which, I have two pieces of exercise equipment and I have, I'm trying to figure out which one I want to buy or which one I want to return. And then it's one thing to like, make me think which one makes me feel better or which one sparks joy, right? But like, if I were to try to return one of them and they, the store doesn't allow me to, how would I feel in that case? Am I happy enough with it that I would, with you know to keep the item if i needed to and then the next question is would i for me to even go and attempt to make a return would i feel like a bad person just to try to do that so then I, that weighs into the decision as well this so you can take one situation and just see it on different levels of feeling and if there's something i want to point out about fi is that one of the biggest um misrepresentations of fi is that it's selfish i think it can be selfish but it is not necessarily or inherently selfish. Um, what it is, is this, it, it could be more like, it could be more about like what Jung called the self in terms of like the collective self. I just want to point that out there. <laughs> yeah. I kind of find myself thinking about FI and then like thinking, is this FI enough to be FI? So I kind of, that's what it maybe feels like to me, this, <laughs> well, you know, I guess like, I feel that it's mostly exhausting, but this constant like um, evaluating and assessing is this uh, right? Is this wrong uh, for me? Is this right? Is this left? And just this constant sense of uh, weighing everything or my ex experience up to see if, but like, I don't say if it matches. Well, yeah, I guess it's a sense of authenticity, even though I'm not necessarily very much in touch with my authenticity, but there's always the kind of comparing um, in that sense as to kind of what is uh, right for me and what feels good and right. Uh, so yeah, and that's in most contexts. And I guess when it, com when it comes to things like dancing, I feel like it's, I don't know if it's if, if FI is the function, but I do feel kind of like fuel um, or, or yeah, I don't know about that, but. Yeah, that's what I have to say. Yeah, and because FI has the property of evaluating and valuing and seeing the worth of things, sometimes with some FI users, they can go into a thought spiral about, am I a good person or am I a bad person? Kind of like evaluating the good or bad within something in themselves sometimes. And so anything else anyone wants to add? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I definitely think about it in terms of my personal values, uh, especially in terms of, you know, what I think is right and what I think is wrong. And because I, uh, 
It's definitely a filtering system for me because I don't want to like just think of like you know broad sweeping generalizations in terms of like oh this is ethical this is not. I like to think about I like to imagine it ties into the NE I suppose a bit or even SI if I'm reflecting on past experiences is like okay well why did this scenario upset me or like if I imagine this scenario like why why am I not bothered by it and then I try to like filter it down as like and get a sense of like. Okay, so the, what, like, what am I like? What are like the core threads of uh, my morality? And I do think, and this might tie into being an, a nine on the Enneagram because they have real issues with expressing their anger. And I often think about it, it's like, what am I prepared to get angry about? Where it's like, no, like I am actually ready to fight for this thing, uh, you know, for whether because I think it's the right thing to do or because I think it's whatever's happening is the wrong thing to do. Uh, and I, I enjoy having that. I, f I find uh, the more I think about it, I find I, the less likely I am to be uh, triggered by anything in the outside world, just going about my day to day. It's like, this suddenly pissed me off and I don't know why. And I, now I don't know what to do. But if I've had time to reflect on it and think about, okay, well, this is, you know, because thought about it in this scenario and I've imagined these examples or like this really hurt me like 10, 20 years ago. Uh, I, fi I find it, it's just a wonderfully solid foundation. And it's not to say that these are going to be permanent because I can, I always have the freedom to adjust them as time goes by. So, but it's a sense of security, I find. Something I like to add is like, yes, on one hand, I do think, um, Intro feeling has to do with valuation, right? On the other hand, there's also this aspect of it that uh, has a great deal of tolerance because there's a great deal of um, uh, compassion and tolerance for the for the messiness of human nature, right? We know that every situation is like very unique and it's just a very different. And so, in regards to the human experience, there could be, there, I think, just like a high degree of like a tolerance that things don't necessarily fit into like a certain standard or a certain kind of way. There's a lot of individuality and a lot of com compassion for people's pain. I think it's also like a, it could be a, a very empathetic function. It's not, um, maybe it's not like always like in a moment, like expert feeling, but it, so like, I know like ex introvert feeling has been described as kind of being asynchronous in a way, right? But uh, we, we do have like a deep well of caring for others. I think F5 for me uh, is a sense of like, what is, like, how do I behave as a human being according to who I am right now, according to my memories and, and, and also who I can be as well. And also how, how can I allow other people express their own humanity in a way that that seeks to understand people, but also it doesn't tolerate injustice, right? Yeah, it, it doesn't tolerate like bullies. It doesn't tolerate like people that just genuinely don't give a shit about stuff, right? Like they, like, because I think INFPs, we care about a lot of different things. And I think for me, it's like, what is, what is the most beautiful? What is the most truthful? What is the most correct right like what is the highest ideals and i think correct in, in like the most loose kind of way um but i think uh for me it's kind of pursuing these things and learning about these things until i can distill it into like a way of living that hopefully that i can live myself but also all of humanity can kind of live and enjoy in um so it's actually far more universal i, I would say that I have a lot of more universal aspirations in the same way as INFJs. I don't know if that's a four five one thing, um, but but yeah, like it's it's much more about that. And and sometimes like some people's individual expressions, it's it's toxic, right? Like and and, and you kind of see that in so, social media, right? Where where egocentric or narcissistic people are just like spreading disinformation and stuff like that but yeah i'm rambling i'll stop that but yeah that's a th that's how my fi um expresses itself yeah yeah martin that's uh that's the enneagram one there so 
The, yeah. if, if you have an INFP with a one in their tri-type, you're going to have someone who is more reformy in the sense that this is a value I want everyone to have. Yeah. So it looks and, and that's funny because I, I want it to, so I can protect people's individuality, right? <laughs> like, and, and that's the most kind of like frustrating thing about it, right? Yeah. And Kevin? I guess, yeah, my introverted feeling kind of plays out. Um, when I first started learning about this stuff, like one of the first realizations or like connections I made was like, I like to, I really like to wear shirts uh, that represent the causes that I feel are important to myself. So uh, back in the day, I used to wear a lot of um, to write love on our arm shirts, which is a organization about mental health. So I guess like today I was just like, what should I wear? And I was like, oh, I'll wear another cause shirt. And I'm like, oh, okay, so I, I'm wearing another cause shirt. That's introverted feeling based. That's lovely. And so let's go on to the next function, extroverted intuition. How do you experience that? I mean, that's, uh, yeah, that's I have a very strange relationship with that function. Well, it, it mostly, I mean, I think that's the side of the INFP that everyone will see the most, especially since it's an extroverted function. Uh, but it's usually a lot of screwing around. Um, I mean, I think it's very, I would say it's apparent in uh, Leon's decision to um, opposite day kind of thing you know they're just like playing around with the patterns and stuff and uh, that's where you get um yeah yeah just like the more uppity like uh, i guess coming up with all these interesting things like abstract things playing from the air just boop, 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 boop. yeah i feel like in these ox position my ne is often trying to help my fi achieve its goal so if FI is saying, I want to feel a certain way, I'll start coming up with ideas on how to make that happen um, or different ways of thinking about the situation so that it could bring me some clarity or some emotional clarity. Yeah. And sometimes it can get a little bit out of hand. I will admit that much. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of like thank any for like providing like the like, zest of, of life because it's just so um so oh no my, my battery um i have i feel like i have a lot of um excitement about life and the world because of this experience of like connecting the dots and uh finding everything interesting and i guess um i don't usually f follow up with these things but the sort of energy that i may like yeah i guess i'm yeah i'm grateful to any because yeah it's just that uh things uh, constantly spark and um and yeah um i think i'd like to try the any which is more uh doing things in the outside world rather than the any on wikipedia um but yeah, it's, it's, it, for me, it's just, an, it's just an exciting function. Yeah, my any exhausts me, but it gives me purpose in life. It's exhausting in the sense that there are so many different possibilities and realities and things I want to do um, and things I could master. I find that it can get me out of mental ruts, um, out of like, if I get into FISI, it can help me free myself of, uh, out of that and flip me into a state where there's a sense of self-renewal and a sense of, um, of, uh, of new possibilities, right? When I, when I feel cynical, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I sometimes have a love-hate relationship with my any because like, like you said, Martin, like, yeah, it can exhaust me uh, if left unchecked for a while. And I, I do find it very inspiring, especially in times where like, uh, like I'm, you know, just feeling like a bit down on myself because it, it, there's a certain optimistic quality to any, I find, not to overly personify it where, yeah, it's all about expanding and like making connections and seeing like what's possible and, and what's so great is like these possibilities don't actually have to exist because you can just create another one and so on and so forth. And I really have found it's helped to spend time with any doms personally when it comes to developing that, because just when, you know, you like if I'm by myself, I'll be like, wow, my any is really good. 
yeah, good for me. And then I spent time <laughs> with a couple, like a few years ago, I got to sit down with uh, Heidi Prieb and Nate Rassa, who are both ENFPs. And like, I was just like a spectator at one point because they're just like, just going back and forth amongst each other. And it was amazing. Just like, all these like random ideas they started sharing. And I find it's a real point of inspiration because eventually I'll find a possibility that connects with my FI and I will latch onto it because it's like, oh, wow, I see value in this possibility. And that actually fuels me to express myself in a, in a certain way. And it just gives me, really gives me a wonderful sense of purpose and uh, confidence in my own expression. Oh, um, and I, I'm a female ESTJ, by the way. I live in Antarctica. <laughs> oh, um, I think like, um, yeah, I think that's just really well well put. I think that really shows like uh, Paul's talking about there, like almost like that, there's like that bit of a priority of the FI, right? But then it's still like very fun to also engage in expert intuition for its own sake. It's kind of, it's almost like kind of its own language. So if you're, uh, if any people are, are around other, expert intuiting people are around other extra, extra intuiting people, it's like, it, it sounds like we're from like another planet. Like we just like kind of bounce ideas like really, really fast and, and uh, people outside, they can't really follow along. I also think um, on the other hand, yeah, there, there could be like a very like, a, there's a contrarian quality to it. So like when people are presenting a certain kind of idea, you're always like thinking about what is the opposite of that, of that idea. <laughs> That's really well put, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is yeah. a kind of funny idea because the funny thing is sometimes I can I I know that I have a feeling of being contrarian and then I go through like uh and I, I I go through this thing in my mind where I was like, oh, am I just being contrarian just to be contrarian? And then I recognize that and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna stop myself. So <laughs> it's a it's it's an interesting thing because I, I I see that with other people too. I was just like, oh, they're just being contrarian because for the sake of being contrarian, not being necessarily correct or accurate. But, but yeah, that's how I see things, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'd like to be more comfortable with being um, contrarian um, because it's, it's, a, it's a thing that my friends used to affectionately like make fun of me for as a teenager was like my first like response was always no to something and that kind of died and I, I just became more like agreeable um, because there's this sort of, um, I have this, this blowback or, or punishment that I, I, I kind of expect for being controversial or rocking the boat. So I'm, I'm very much like, I'm more inclined to kind of uh, try to keep the peace in a way that I feel that doesn't benefit me. And it's funny because even though I guess maybe like um, uh, ENTP may have like the reputation of being kind of devil's advocate thing uh, type, I was listening to a person, personality hacker podcast about um, e ENTP growth. And I kind of agreed with those growth points of just, you know, being comfortable with, um, you know, maybe saying things that will like, you know, rock the boat um, a bit because I feel like I've gone the other way in trying to kind of yeah, preserve a false harmony because I don't, you know, want to experience like the blowback of say being controversial or whatever, so. Makes sense. Makes sense. And so I have to go in 15 minutes, so <laughs> we might need to be wrapping up soon. Um, we'll go to the next cognitive function, which is, oh my gosh, my brain. <laughs> Introverted something. Oh, I know, I, I, oh, that's, I, a, that's a perfect point. That's a perfect point to forget. <laughs> <laughs> How do you all experience SI? I'm the turn signal king. I'm good with turn signals because that's like the most out of driving. That's the, the one component that's SI driven rather than SC in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I, yeah, in the relief role or the third one or auxiliary, I guess. Oh, wait, no, it's not auxiliary. Relief role, whatever. Uh, I do find myself um, sometimes watching the same videos or listening to the same songs over again for the familiarity uh, once in a while, like watch some history stuff and just be really into it for some reason. So it's like learning about the past and how not to make uh, the same mistakes again, I guess. So I kind of wonder that like my essay kind of feels like a, like a, a pseudo and I, in a sense that I'm, 
I feel like I'm so, like overly attached to like the story of my life making sense and you know trying to make that life movie that has like starting from my childhood and having it logically progress to the to the future. So I kind of feel I can be like uh, stuck. Um, maybe it's that kind of maybe loop thing in a sense of just really being connected to my sense of identity in the past as it pertains to the present and, and future. I find that there, SI, especially if it's not as well developed, can have some perfectionism about it, which can be good or bad. Um, so for instance, I'm a very, I'm very particular as we've already seen about my shopping choices or about like my physical reality and I want things in a particular way. Um, I think that Yes, perfectionism is probably not great, but if it's in a certain context where the analysis can lead a company or some organization to, you know, make a big impact by changing a few details, then the SI can be very helpful in that sense. But otherwise, there, there, it needs to be controlled, I guess, to a certain extent. <laughs> um, internally, it's, it's uh, very self-critical, but at the same time, like of uh, of moral or ethical in uh, inadequacies and in even things I have said. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's just filled with memory, right? Like a, a tree, right? You, you cut it and you see all the rings. So that's your, that's all your SI and you see your pain and your joys and sorrows and stuff like that. Um, outwardly, like actually critiquing other people, it's more of about remembering other people's uh, lack of perfection, um, but also things that they've done good as well too. Um, so that's how I, I, I see my SI um, outwardly, and and also remembering what th things have happened in history and and how have people interpreted those things in history, um, and and how that kind of bears in mind of how we interpret events happening now um and and how we should take that seriously or not right and how we can reform things today yeah your enneagram one in your tri-type is so strong <laughs> yeah yeah i know i can't believe i said i was a nine because it's definitely not uh but yeah like i it's really infuriating because i find like four five ones are very not satisfied <laughs> with their life or the outside world so yeah it's like extreme idealism right yeah it is yeah 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 and i find that plus being i, I believe a spiritual director or something along the lines of that it amplifies the oneness i find like infp plus religious background equals like even stronger si or like si plus enneagram one i don't know so, how to explain it there's an enneagram one spin to but, it but it's funny because as an INFP, you still see yourself as like different than other people. Like you'd rather be like a monastic monk, like critiquing society and stuff rather than being in like the mainstream. And you don't fit necessarily in different types of hierarchical structures and things like that too. But you don't completely deny them as well. So <laughs> that's amazing. Anyone else want to add to SI? Uh, just to say, I love my SI, uh, definitely the older I get. And, uh, I just to use an analogy, I think of it as like a library, but an extremely comfortable library. It's not cold. It's not aesthetic. There are lots of like plush cushions and things, and I can just, you know, pick up, you know, some tome. Uh, it's a very dynamic library. It's not the official Dewey Decimal System, because there's a whole thing about like, you know, pop culture trivia. And then all my banking information is left in a cardboard box outside in an alley <laughs> to be filed away at some point. Uh, but it's just wonderfully comforting. And uh, it's just a place I can really like get lost in for a while. Sometimes I go down a wrong corner of the library and it's like, hey, we're these are all the th times, you know, you screwed up or people laughed at you or, you know, people were mean to you and and I can't get out, you know. And then sometimes the straight laced librarian comes around the corner and says, sir, the library closed 15 minutes ago. And <laughs> I won't elaborate on that. But 
That, that was some very I, powerful I, NE imagery, by the way. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> that was so cool. Yeah, that was fun. That was amazing. You should, I can get you a membership. <laughs> it's wonderful. Is it a monthly membership? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're allowed to see your past paints, too. <laughs> yeah, it depends on how often you want to visit. Um, I was going to say that SI is really good at um, remembering things, holding details that other people often can't believe that I remember. Um, when pe people tell me so many things about their lives and I can pull up the most like obscure or remember the most obscure things that they're surprised that I remember um, about them. So I think it helps, you know, in, yeah, building relationships in, in a sense is that I, I don't forget certain details about people. Um, Paul, thank you so much for bringing up that analogy because like, I keep telling myself, enjoy the journey. And I keep thinking I need to like substitute my SI for SE in order to do that. But I think something I'm just realizing now is SI can also be a, not just a destination, but a journey as well. And that one that can be enjoyed as I'm creating my SI fortresses. But uh, yeah, so thanks. My pleasure. <laughs> yes. Um, and I, I, agree, I agree with Paul. That's a nice, it's a really nice place to hang out, like the SI, especially combined with intrude feeling. It's like, that's where, it, if, you know, it really hits the feels in the SI. Yeah. And it's where the neuroticism can kind of build sometimes too. <laughs> and so let us go to extroverted thinking. How do you all experience TE? Piles, piles of items everywhere. And then you have to clean up the piles. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's an aspirational role. So it really does, I feel like, when I look at like the way that I organize my external environment, it's just like, you, you tried. You tried. I find often in the theory, people say that the second function is, the, is like the way out of a stressful situation. But I feel like for me, it's, it's more my fourth, my TE, because... Um, for me, I'm coming up with solutions on how to solve, and I guess the any is still there, but on how to solve my problems. But I'll make it like a concrete system in my mind where I tell myself, okay, if I encounter this situation again in the future, this is how I'm going to react. This is what I'm going to do. And it, it becomes like that system. So, yeah, that's how I use my tea. I mean... I think my T is almost everything. <laughs> it's over analyzing my own emotions, analyzing other people. Um, yeah, imagining different kind of scenarios. Um, but yeah, trying to solve this problem of life that can only be lived, though. Um, yeah, I think it's like reflecting upon the past as well and, and uh, just learning from your mistakes. And um, yeah, learning from other people, being humble. Right? Yeah, I think T for me um, is, yeah, I guess um, anxiously trying to keep up or play the game of, of life um, and realizing how much I'm failing. Uh, I feel like I, I just have this like uh, determination to get stuff done, which doesn't go well. And I, it's so um, I have ADHD as well. So there's a sense of like life is not being managed, um, actively happening, where, like wherever I go, like, I, like, and so the kind of disorganizedness of everything is a thing that I'm, I'm, it's very like local and frequent and constant. So there's this kind of preoccupation of how um, I'm adulting or failing at adulting with, with TE you know, for me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, T, to me, <laughs> T, I almost said to T, but anyway, uh, it's, it's definitely a way I have of just being more effective and efficient in my life. And I get, I almost get like that kind of like endorphin high, like when I perform a task, whether it's like just organizing my workflow you know, for, and maybe saving myself, you know, a few minutes. And I can't necessarily, I, I wouldn't want to do it all day, but if I can do it for like, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, 
you know, and th then of course, you know, you, you marry a TE Dom and <laughs> you find out just like how, how impressive, uh, you know, someone's uh, dominant TE function is when they see what they do, <laughs> but you know, baby steps. Leon? Oh, uh, I, I, I can relate with what Paul's saying in terms of um, that, that high you get from expert thinking. Um, because often it's not like, um, it's not there. Like you're not on task with anything, right? <laughs> like, uh, but like when you get, like when you get into TE zone, you kind of feel like you, you have like a pair of legs that help you to walk. It's, and it, it feels like you're like finally, finally free in a way. Like you, you're, you're not like stuck. I love that you use the word freedom because I feel like TE is often viewed as restriction and <laughs> structure. It's so interesting to see the the the, the, the paradox there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oftentimes TE has opposing aims to FI. So TE is known for a desire to standardize, systematize, almost take out the individuality from things. And so oftentimes FI can do TE as long as it doesn't get in the way of some sort of FI value. But oftentimes TE can very much get in the way of FI values. So adopting TE kind of metricized way of doing things can take out the humanness of doing something. And so sometimes there can be a, a level of rejection too with it. Some other ways inferior TE can show up is... For some INFPs, it can come up as a discomfort with telling people what to do because it's like, well, do you sincerely want to do this? Or is this like something that matches your individual nature? So it can be hard to like always like order people around because you, you want to respect their individuality as a person. But sometimes when TE does come out for FI dominant types, it can come out a little sharper. So it's like there are moments of complete chillness, like you're just a very chill person. There are moments where you're like super sharp. And people are like, whoa, that is way sharper than, it. like, I sometimes find FPs have sharper TE, like it comes out a little bit sharper than even TJs sometimes because it's like unnatural. So those I don't know what you're talking about, Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lie. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. This is, this is just a bunch of crazy talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess I, I have a fear around um, maybe tied to FIMT that if I were to be truly authentic, that I would be kind of blunt a lot of the time, yeah. <laughs> and yes. I could I, I possibly have that kind of struggle and and tension between being, and this is why maybe as a kind of coping, I try to be as tactful as possible because there's the other side of of not being, and I'm like, oh, how, how can this be conducive to I don't know, human relationships, but there's that flip thing to, for me. Yeah, to be honest, I think as a 451, I really enjoy using it sometimes because I finally get to tell people like what I really think. And and, 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 and it's kind of freeing, I, I think. Like it's more authentic to who I am. Um, but also, yeah, like I don't want to turn people completely off like because I know, I know how I might kind of come across. So it's it's a struggle between having high ideals, but also a sense of like, I want to be respectful for, of other people. Yeah. 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 Oh, Nathan, you look like you want. Yeah, to I that. find that yes, okay, maybe my TE can be cutting, but with whenever I use TE, especially if I'm using it in a group setting, like I'll always have that FI or clause or perceiver clause, like, but there you we, there can be exceptions. <laughs> If you want an exception, come speak with me or something, you know? So it's like, it's like TE, but not for the sake of TE. It's like, it's just a tool <laughs> for something else. Yeah. It's a tool for your FI. Yeah. It's your slave. Yeah. <laughs> your TE is a slave for your FI. Yeah, slave, <laughs> yeah, sometimes I want my TE to be a slave, my FI to be a slave to my TE. Something you said, Joyce, um, that... I resonate with, but I, I forgot exactly what it was, but I resonated. And it was this sense that because I've, I've, I've also like, I've wanted to be creative and fantasize about like kind of my identity as a creative or someone who writes, I was kind of envied, like I, I would make the choice to become like a, um, a creative robot. Like I kind of have had like um, envy towards like really like prolific, uh, uh, prolific creatives who can just produce 
content. And there's part of me that would want to be this like TE efficient, produce creative work all day, endlessly, nonstop side. So I think there's, there's the FYT kind of thingy happening. Yeah, yeah, that, absolutely. That That's really well put, Nigel. And so like a good example of of FI noticing when things are too TE is like flower arrangement. Let's say like there's a really TE TJ arranging flowers and they're like the most efficient way to arrange flowers is you put the flower here and then here and then here. And then the FI users like that's so mechanical. It strips it of its humanity to have a standard process for how to do something that's supposed to be a little bit more self-expressive or a little bit more like it's, it's kind of inhuman. It's a little robot <laughs> I mean, sometimes we just don't care. It's just like, why does this matter? <laughs> it's like, just do whatever you want, as long as it doesn't fall down. I don't know. I, I really like Nigel's dream, by the way. I was like picturing myself as a robot, like shooting out these like tasks, like, psh, psh, psh. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Leon was bringing out as any to make that funny connection. Yep, yep. And so thank you everyone for coming out and sharing your INFP perspective. It was wonderful and a blissful time being in your inner rich worlds with you all. And Kevin, thank you so much for bringing up the hard life analogy, how being an INFP can be like living the game of life on hard mode. That's insightful. And that is so true. And it hits home. Yeah, well, well put. Kevin has an amazing Udemy course on MBTI basics located down below in the description. Can't you see his uh, level of tech awesomeness? It just shows you how you should check it out. And so, yay. <laughs> Leon, thank you for your silliness. You are goofy. You're a goofy goober ball of always changing your name tag whenever you come on my show. And so never a dull day. Always chaos, but in a <laughs> in subtle ways when it comes to Leon. And so go check out his channel. It is called Type Tips and it is rad. And yeah, he'll N-E your socks off. And thanks, Paul, for your amazing library metaphors or analogies and your your puns and your humor, your inner comedian, and the ability you have to kind of use your any to craft those really interesting analogies. And you being a writer also adds on to the well-craftedness of that. So well done. And Martin, you're edgy. You're so edgy. I'm not yeah. goddamn edgy. Don't say that about me. <laughs> I'm, a nice, I'm a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, anyways. Yeah, the four in your and the one in your tri type makes you extra spicy. You're like a feisty INFP TM. Yeah, so there you go. And it's really nice to hear your perspectives because you're doubly in tune with your authenticity. You're an INFP and also you're a core four too. So you're double authentic. So you slap on that authenticity real, really amazing. And uh, you're the greatest Pac Man. Uh, pa Pac-Man pastor for your career. <laughs> and Nigel, it's nice to hear your wonderful insights into SI and how it's about really going into your experiences in that level of depth and almost like seeing how it fits into your identity in some way. And that was very powerful. There was also moments where you talked about you know, that word salad. And I thought it was a really good way of putting extroverted intuition, just the, it, it's known as like word vomit and word salad. So that was like pretty, pretty rad that you brought that up. Um, and thanks for watching Type Talks. I appreciate the viewership. It warms my heart. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for that warmth. And thanks, Nathan, for coming over here and and sharing your lovely take on things your excel spreadsheet awesomeness into your extroverted thinking is it shows infps how they could utilize these kind of te things to accelerate their te growth so can, can, can we have like uh like a whole entire talk just on infps and spreadsheets <laughs> <laughs> i made one oh, I don't need them. <laughs> oh gosh spreadsheets <laughs> I mean, whatever works for you, right? <laughs>
<laughs> That's too funny. Thank and, you, everyone. And, and also turn signals too. Yeah. <laughs> I I I congratulate you on that, by the way. I I am like parasitical about <laughs> turn signals. I get so angry at people when they it's, don't. Um, it's not just a behavior; it's a lifestyle. It's all about sending signals to other people and acknowledging and false signals sometimes too, which is fun. Joyce, Joyce, we can't end this talk now. We have to talk about this topic for yeah, another sorry, hour. Sorry, sorry, Joyce. <laughs> we, we, we need to, we're derailing it. Okay. Yeah, this is what happens when I have extroverted intuiting on my panels. Like, there's no at natural endpoint. And so I have to be, like, extra. All right, guys. We are, we are ending this. <laughs> there's no such thing as time, Joyce. It's just a social construct. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Have a lovely an afternoon or whatever oh, time you, that is. <laughs>